Well, I thought my picking would set him on fire, but nobody wanted to hire a guitar man. Long before he was known as the sidekick in Smokey and the Bandit, Jerry Reed was celebrated as the guitar man. Today, this iconic singer-songwriter has been honored by American veterans for his contributions to music and culture. From a challenging upbringing in foster care to earning three Grammy Awards, Jerry Reed's journey is a testament to the American dream. After years of toil in a cotton mill and serving in the Army, Reed achieved fame in the country music world. However, despite his many triumphs, he faced a lifelong battle with addiction. Join us as we delve into the remarkable life and poignant story of Jerry Reed. Jerry Reed's Early Life Today the mastery of Jerry Reed has disappeared from the world of music, but if it wasn't for the Atlanta-born singer, actor, the country music genre perhaps wouldn't have garnered massive mainstream success in the times when Reed was writing music and plucking his guitar. Country music desperately lacked the it factor. The genre was wildly popular, but it needed a fresh, handsome face to become a musical benchmark. Well, I put my job down at Carr, my mommy goodbye, not by sundown I left King Guar. This is perhaps why Reed's career was so monumental. He was a pretty face who could sing, act, and play the guitar almost effortlessly. As it stands today, when a young country music artist picks up the guitar, they seek to imitate Reed's sheer prowess over the instrument. According to the sources close to the singer, he always knew that he was meant to be a star, but his childhood proved to be profoundly difficult. As a young artist, he didn't have much to go by. He was and wasn't rich, and both his parents held blue-collar jobs in a cotton mill. So how did Reed break into the world of music? Well, his story starts on March 20th, 1937, when Robert and Cynthia Hubbard had their second child born in Atlanta, Georgia. Reed was always surrounded by music and art, but as a child, Reed was obsessed with moving to Nashville so he could play his guitar and write his songs with the musicians he grew up admiring. Since the conditions at home were pretty harsh, the young artist would occasionally visit his grandparents who lived in Rockmart in Pea County, Georgia. It was Rockmart and its musical ties that would inspire Reed to dream big. Perhaps this is why whenever Jerry would visit his grandparents, he would run around with his guitar screaming that he's going to be a star one day. Yet his musical education was extremely seasonal. You see, when Reed was only four months old, his parents decided to end their marriage. Since Robert and Cynthia couldn't figure out the child custody arrangements, their two children had to bear the burden of their failed marriage. The money was tight too. Even working double shifts in the cotton mill couldn't have run two separate households with two young children. The aftermath was pretty tragic for the largest part of his childhood. Jerry Reed and his sister were in and out of foster homes and orphanages. Despite both of their parents being alive and well, within the first seven years of. His life, Reed had shuttered across several foster homes in Georgia. Even though he was very young, he knew that his birth had added a further strain to his parents' already turbulent marriage. That's just one part of the story, though. Of course, every musician needs a painful muse to channel their emotions and write emotionally vulnerable lyrics. Yet for a seven-year-old child, the reality was challenging to even fathom. It would be Reed's mother who would strive hard to give her children a loving and caring home. She knew that her son had a musical bone in him, and she would go to every length to make sure he got to live some part of his very idealistic dream. So she worked extremely hard to earn extra pennies at the mill. During her strive, she fell in love once again and decided to marry Hubert Howard, her co-worker at the factory in the year 1944. Jerry Reed and his sister finally got the chance to come back home. Financial conditions hardly improved though. During such tough times, music became a solace for the family and it would be Jerry who would entertain his family with his usual antics. Turns out the young man was born to be a performer. In the evenings, a six-year-old Jerry would pick up a pretend microphone and belt whatever was playing on the radio. He didn't have a fancy house or a musical instrument, so his usual picks were his mother's hairbrush and the wood stockpile to make a stage. 
While talking to Pickin in 1979, the musician reminisced over his tough childhood and how he made sure to live every moment in his own words. When I was a kid of six or seven, I used to get up on the stove wood pile for a stage and I'd put on the wildest show. I'd sit beside the radio and listen to the grand old Opry and play rhythm on a hairbrush. Such experiences molded Reed's musical trajectory. In the same interview, the musician also talked about how he was just obsessed with rocking the stage. He didn't dream of anything else but to go to Nashville and sing his tunes for his audiences. He didn't even consider a safer career option or an alternative path. Reed knew that even if he didn't crack the country music success formula, he show up in bars and roadsides just to play his music. Oh well, destiny had other plans though. Yet other than a fateful intervention, it was Cynthia who recognized that she had to support her son's musical aspirations, even if they sounded impossible or crazy. So after months of saving money, she was able to collect $7. While it wasn't enough to buy a new guitar, luckily for the mother's-son duo, their neighbor was selling his old instrument. Cynthia made sure to close the deal and get her son his first-ever guitar. Reed was over the moon. Since his mother had some knowledge of the instrument, he constantly bugged her to teach him new chords. Cynthia had a tough job, but she did her best. In fact, it was she who taught the legendary guitarist his first chords. As per the musician's interviews, his mother taught him C and G and a claw hammer G. His excitement about learning his first chords was so immense that the young Jerry Reed began to drive his mother crazy. She would get back from work, and her son was ready to learn something new with his guitar in his hand. The family didn't even have enough money to buy a guitar pick, so the young artist used a nickel as his pick and strummed as his mother instructed him to do. So according to the man himself, the guitar was a bit shabby, but it was enough for him to seal his future. The rusty guitar taught Reed the art to be an entertainer, and we can't argue that he was a phenomenal presence on the stage. Talking about this life-changing experience, Jerry Reed said, I'd sit on the trunk in the kitchen. I'd get up there cause I wanted to be on stage, you know? I always wanted to be an entertainer and I don't have any other memories of ever wanting to be anything else. This is why the country musician is the perfect embodiment of dreams coming true, but not before a period of struggle or hardship. Jerry Reed begins his musical journey. There was a time when Cynthia had taught Reed everything he knew, so it was the perfect moment to branch out and learn music from the actual masters. Shortly enough, Reed found out that everyone wanted him to do things that everyone was already doing. He was determined to make his natural playing style the essence of his musical journey, but the trajectory wasn't easy. However, naturally, there was still a lot of speculation about who had taught Jerry Reed the phenomenal art of strumming. When he told people that he was self-taught, he was either laughed off or his audiences just stared at him. Truth be told, the legendary guitarist only took two lessons in his life, and after he was left dissatisfied, he quit his classes. Talking to a reporter in 1969, Jerry recalled his first and only guitar lessons from an unknown guy in his neighborhood. Everything seemed to go well until the tutor asked Reed to throw his thumb pick away, and well, the aspiring musician didn't like that. So he quit and instead decided to teach himself the guitar after listening to his idols on the radio. One of his earliest and most powerful influences was Merle Travis, who was a Western Kentucky singer and songwriter. It's deeply unfortunate that Travis's name hardly pops up when we talk about the defining decade for country music, as well as the maestro for guitar for Reed. Travis was nothing short of a hero. Known for his fluid finger-style guitar, the Kentucky musician inspired a generation of guitarists who dubbed his style as Travis Picking. He was also very visceral and blunt with his lyrics in a highly turbulent America. He was singing about the plight and economic exploitation of coal miners in the country. Needless to say, for the son of two very underprivileged factory workers, Travis was a musical messiah. In particular, he was deeply inspired by the song called I Am a Pilgrim. 
when Reed first heard the song and its masterful guitar rendition, he was blown away. He immediately knew that if he embarked on a musical journey of his own, he'd have to channel his inner Merle Travis. In his own words, I thought when I heard it, boy, there it is. That man is walking with the big dog. He knows where the bodies are buried, and I want some of that. By the time the aspiring musician entered Atlanta's O'Keeffe High School, he was still learning guitar and experimenting with his tunes. Alongside, he had also begun to write and sing his songs that sounded novel in the first listen. But then one would get mesmerized with the tunes. While singing and songwriting remained his foremost passions, Reed was also challenging the boundaries of being an entertainer. Very quickly, he got interested in acting and theater. His easygoing charm brought him a lot of attention, and in no time, he was landing roles in his freshman and sophomore years at O'Keeffe. Reed was thriving. He was encapsulated in the world of acting, and he also had a big audience available for his music venture. But the gimmick also ran short. By his junior year, the young musician had lost interest in education as it took away from his music practice. He didn't think conventional education was important since he already knew what he wanted to do in his life. So he left school in his junior year and began to work in the Atlanta cotton mill as his day job. When he would get free from work, he would dive straight into his music gigs. He would hit as many local honky-tonks as he could in the hopes of honing his performing skills. From the streets of Atlanta to shady underground bars, Reed was performing everywhere and had found optimal success. After all, his sound was pretty familiar at the start of his career. Jerry was closely patterning his musical idols such as Hank Williams and Tommy Collins. Later, he would break into a style that was distinctly his, but for a teenager, he was splendid on guitar. This is why he had found a small but supportive fan base in Atlanta, particularly in the bars where he was performing his masterful skills got solid recognition in 1954 when a local Atlanta policeman was left mesmerized by Reed's breathtaking guitar skills. So he made an effort to introduce the teenager to Bill Lowry, who used to be a very popular disc jockey in the region. After his career apex, he went into the music publishing business and also helmed a very famous live country music show on Saturday mornings over WGST radio. The policeman named Leroy Sooner arranged for Reed to audition in front of Lowry, and let's say the radio mogul was blown away. While talking to Jim Schmidt in 1989, Lowry recalled Reed's groundbreaking audition. He told the interviewer that rather than picking a well-known song to showcase his vocals and guitar skills, Jerry went for an original self-penned song called Aunt Meg's Wooden Leg. Even the title of the song seemed bizarre, and true to its word, the tune was a novelty. Lowry hadn't heard anything like that before, and that became the primary reason why he agreed to mentor Reed. The music publisher was also quick to recognize that the youth needed to put a lot of effort into improving his songwriting. The best way to learn was to be in the company of the very individuals who knew what they were doing. It was Lowry who negotiated Reed's first tour gig. Jerry Reed had landed himself a 30-day tour opening act for Ernest Tubb and the Texas Troubadours. The opportunity was so lucrative that it killed Reed's afterthoughts about going back to school. He knew that the day job at the cotton mill wouldn't yield much, so he might need to go earn his diploma to earn an honest man's living. Talking about his realization, Jerry Reed once told the interviewer, school was never the same after that. Reed later said, I knew what I was going to spend my life doing. Nothing else made any sense. Nothing else made any difference. The road gig with Ernest Tubb and the Texas Troubadours opened up the young musician to several opportunities. Early musical success in a blink of an eye, Jerry's career had taken off. He had gone from performing in bars and his school's auditorium to performing with the biggest names in the musical industry. After his successful gig with Ernest Tubb and the Texas Troubadours, Lowry was able to broker even more musical appearances for the youth. Sure, Reed still had a long way to go in his solo career, but under Lowry, he got to learn from several musicians. 
It was almost magical that the radio mogul had introduced Reed to Capitol Records when he was just a junior in high school. After quitting for good, Jerry got the golden chance to perform with musicians like Ernest Tubb, Marcel. He couldn't believe his luck as he kept working as an opening or supporting act. He was able to harness his skills even more. Perhaps that's all the training Reed needed to make it big as a defining country musical act. Alongside his gigs, Reed began to work at WGST radio station as a part-time disc jockey. Once again, it was Lowry who had come to his rescue. To work in the cotton mill was an option for the young musician who wanted to stay connected with the art itself. Plus, he had single-handedly witnessed the economic exploitation in the industry. Typically, when Reed wasn't touring, he would work his day job. And at night, he used to perform with a band that Lowry managed, Kenny Lee and the Western Playboys. Playing with a band regularly worked like a charm for the Atlanta musician. Every single day, he was free to experiment with his guitar techniques. There was a viable audience too, so Jerry was getting real-time feedback on what his audiences liked and what they didn't. As an entertainer in the making, Reed got the gig of his lifetime with Kenny Lee and the Western Playboys at the same time. His relationship with Lowry grew too, who had become more and more ambitious to make a successful career out of the musician's masterful skills. What really helped Jerry's cause was the network he had established within the musical circles of Atlanta and beyond. He was only 18 years old when he released his first record with Lowry, titled If the Good Lord's Willing and The Creek Don't Rise. It's true that no one really knew Jerry by the time his record was released. However, the song became reasonably popular as more established artists like Johnny Cash regularly covered it. In 1958, Cash not only recorded the song, but also made a decent effort to popularize the hard work of a young artist who had supported him in multiple ventures. Following in the footsteps of Johnny Cash, other musicians began to cover If the Good Lord's Willing and The Creek Don't Rise Too. It isn't surprising that very quickly, Reed had gained popularity at Capitol Records. While the competition was extremely saturated, Jerry was able to make a name for himself as a teenage sensation. You'd be surprised to know that his foremost notable career success at Capitol wasn't in the country genre at all. The teenager had decided to record his very own rockabilly composition for the popular song When I Found You in 1956. Everyone behind the screen was pretty much blown away. The arrangement of the song was quite unique and novel, however, he had a certain flair with how he organized his vocals, as he was trying to break into the country scene as well. The studio deemed it fit if Jerry recorded When I Found You in that particular genre too. Needless to say, Reed was able to showcase that he wasn't a one-trick pony. Both of his iterations were a hit. Indeed, the covers didn't make it out of the studio. The audiences largely remained unaware of the talents of Jerry Reed, but his more successful and established peers would sing his praises all the time. The best was yet to come, though. In 1958, Reed's label mate, Jean Vincent, covered his song Crazy Legs, which pretty much blew up. While the people heard the song in Vincent's voice, the label was quick to credit their teenage sensation for the song's rhythms and well-flowing lyricism. Eventually, Lowry signed the musician to his company, National Recording Corporation. Reed's role in the label was twofold. He was supposed to embark on his journey as a solo artist, but he also worked as a member of the staff band due to his exceptional guitar skills. Alongside legendary names like Joe South and Ray Stevens, Jerry uplifted several musicians at National Recording Corporation. A lot would change in the year 1959, though. It felt like Jerry's career was about to take off, but the timing was almost unfortunate. It's a story as old as time, at the apex of his marriage as well as. His budding career, Jerry had to enlist in the American Army. There wasn't a way out, and the singer-songwriter had to cut ties with Capitol Records. All of his ongoing projects had to be shelved as the musician prepared to serve his country. It still didn't mean that Jerry Reed lost his musical charm whatsoever. While he worried about his future music prospects, 
fate decided to take care of him as he was in the service. Brenda Lee recognized how talented Reed was and decided to work on his composition. You might have guessed it. We are talking about the legendary song That's All You Got To Do, which became Brenda's top 10 pop hit. The song was released at a very crucial point as Reed was busy serving his country. The musical ventures in America were grappling with the talented musician who would soon make a comeback. After his military discharge, Reed set out to fulfill his childhood dream. He wanted to become the quintessential performer who would earn popularity in Nashville and beyond. In 1962, Jerry Reed and his wife Priscilla moved to Nashville, where the duo would start a journey to remember the height of popularity. By the time the married couple moved to Nashville, Priscilla had her own number one country record. She was Roy Drusky's duet partner on the 1965 hit song, Yes, Mr. Peters. While Reed was a name in his own right, having a successful singer as his partner really helped when he was trying to get back into the musical scene. In the same year, Reed decided to kickstart his musical journey with Columbia Records. He was able to score two minor pop hits, Goodnight Irene and Holly Gully. Guitar chart data from that year would show that Jerry wasn't able to garner mainstream success. He knew that he still had a long way to go, but Holly Gully Guitar was able to capture the attention of Chet Atkins at RCA Victor. Since Atkins was deeply impressed by Jerry Reed, he knew that he was going to work with a musician sooner or later. In 1965, Atkins produced Reed's If I Don't Live Up To It. Other than making his own music, the Atlanta musician made several strides as a session, as well as a touring guitarist. He was able to garner significant success in the venture and appeared in several chart makers by Bobby Bear and others. He also wrote successful songs for musicians like Porter Wagoner, including the 1962 chart topper Misery Loves Company. However, after mild success, it was time to switch the labels again. Atkins made sure that Reed signed to RCA Records, where he encouraged the artist to be himself, true to his word. Chad let the artist do whatever he felt like in the studio. There were no rules, and Reed began to feel comfortable in his guitar mastery and songwriting. Soon enough, Jerry was able to develop his own distinctly recognizable and idiosyncratic guitar ideology. In the mainstream, his playing style came to be known as the claw style for the shape of his right hand made. The style skyrocketed the musician's fame. Who was looking for a cultural hit in 1967? Reed released his self-penned hit, Guitar Man, which instantly became Elvis Presley's dream song to cover. Up next, Reed released Tupelo, Mississippi Flash, which was a comic tribute to the legendary musician Presley. The duo was able to start a musical relationship of their own when the guitarist helped Elvis cover Guitar Man while they were in the recording studio. They also worked on Elvis Presley's Big Boss Man. Perhaps this was the moment that Jerry Reed was waiting for. Presley also covered the guitarist's U.S. Mail. The Atlanta musician was over the moon, and it was just the beginning of what was about to come next. Soon enough, Jerry shared a Grammy with Atkins for the critically acclaimed instrumental album, Me and Jerry. The 1971 Grammy success pushed Reed to experiment more with his music, while RCA Records, as well as Atkins, gave him the utmost creative discretion to forge his trajectory. Once again, the formula worked. A year later, Jerry Reed won Best Country Vocal Performance in the male category for his song, When You're Hot, You're Hot. It would take a couple of decades for the Grammys to acknowledge Reed's musical talent. Another nod came in 1993 for the musicians Sneakin' Around, which was a guitar duet with Atkins. The singer was able to bag the Grammy for Best Country Musical Performance. As Jerry Reed would go down as one of the most monumental country artists in the world, his hits like Lord Mr. Ford, East Bound and Down, and She Got the Gold Mine would be forever remembered. Of course, no appreciation for Reed is complete without a special shout out to his instrumental composition, The Claw which remains a dream skill for guitarists to acquire. Reed's marriage and tragic end. 
In a lot of ways, the singer largely lived a controversy-free career mainly because the musicians of. His stature were known to be ladies' men. Not Jerry Reed, though. In 1959, Reed married the country singer Priscilla Mitchell. The union proved to be quite successful, but of course it had its ups and downs too. The couple had recently gotten married when the musician had to leave the country to serve in the army. Priscilla stayed home and built her career. When her husband got discharged, she was the ultimate support for the musician, who had to once again kickstart his musical journey. In their marriage of 61 years, the couple had two children, Sidina Ann Hubbard and Charlotte Elaine Zavala, who were born in 1960 and 1970, respectively. Luckily for Jerry and Priscilla, their daughters decided to embark on country singing too, a venture that has kept the family's musical legacy alive. To add to their skill, Jerry was a constant guide for his two daughters who set out to navigate the challenging sphere of music. However, the family's musical journey had to be halted when not one but two tragedies hit them hard. On September 1, 2008, Jerry Reed died in Nashville after severe complications from empyema. He was 71 years old. The world mourned the loss of the great musician. You see, Jerry didn't have any drug addiction, and he wasn't fond of drinking heavily either. In fact, he was irrevocably addicted to smoking cigarettes, which ultimately started his struggles with lung disease. It was no secret that Reed was a heavy smoker, but his fans were largely unaware of the chronic addiction he had developed in the late 90s. The musician had tried his best to quit smoking for good, but he was unfortunately not very successful. Tom Brash, the son of Merle Travis, was the musician's close friend. It was Brash who had shed light on his friend's nasty habit, which eventually took his life. In the 1990s, Brash had recorded Reed acting out his desire to quit smoking. In 1972, Reed released his single, Another Puff, which outlines the life of a man who is desperately trying to quit smoking. While the singer made Another Puff as a public service message to bring attention to the dangers of smoking, he himself was never able to internalize the message. In the aftermath of her husband's death, Priscilla developed a sense of sadness and depression too. She passed away in 2014. As of today, Reed's daughters are keeping their father's legacy alive. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.